Welcome to Electron Line. One of our viewers indicated that this video had some problems with the focus and the lighting. When we looked at it, we certainly agreed with that. So here we're redoing this very same video. It's a video about thermodynamics and in specific the ideal gas equation. And we're going to do this example where we have a tire which has been pressurized to 44 PSI. PSI stands for pounds per square inch at a temperature of 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And then the question is, what would be the pressure if the temperature drops to 60 degrees Fahrenheit? And we're going to assume that the volume, in essence, doesn't change, that the, the volume before is equal to the volume after, therefore the volume is constant. Now the ideal gas equation is as follows. PV equals nRT, where P is the pressure, V is the volume, T is the temperature, R is the gas constant, and N is the number of moles. Assuming that N and R will remain constant, well, typically what you would do is you write as follows. You would say that P times V divided by the temperature is equal to NR, which is therefore equal to a constant. That means that you can then say that initially P1 V1 divided by T1 is equal to P2 V2 divided by T2. And so therefore, if you know all the conditions before, and you know two to three conditions afterwards, you can then calculate the third one. In this case, we're trying to find the pressure, P2, after the temperature changes. Now, of course, in this case, since V1 is equal to V2, that remains constant as well. So what we could have said, we could have said instead that V, oh, not V, oh, because that's constant, but that P divided by T, I moved the T over to this side, I moved the V over to the other side, so we can write that P divided by T is equal to NR divided by V, which is equal to a constant. That means in this case, since V is also a constant, we can write that P1 over T1 is equal to P2 over T2, and we don't have to worry about the V. Now if you include it, that will be okay, because since V1 and V2 are equal, that will not upset your equation at all. So let's go ahead and use our equation right here. So we're going to get rid of the V1 and V2 because they're constant anyway. And now we're going to solve that equation for P2, the pressure afterwards. So reversing the equation, we write P2 is equal to P1 times the ratio of T2 divided by T1. So all we have to do is plug in the values for P1, T2, and T1, and we can calculate P2. There's just one complicated factor that we have Fahrenheit degrees instead of Kelvin degrees and PSI's instead of atmospheres or Newtons per square meter for the pressure. So we're going to have to convert a few things. First of all, let's convert the pressure. We have gauge pressure, which is of course not the total pressure. The pressure we want in here must be the total pressure, which means that P total is equal to the gauge pressure plus the atmospheric pressure. And in pounds per square inch, atmospheric pressure is 14.7, so this becomes equal to 44 PSI plus 14.7 PSI. In other words, this is equal to, that would be 58.7 PSI. Now, since we want to answer probably in PSI, we can go ahead and leave the pressure in terms of PSI. We don't have to convert it to atmosphere. As long as we have the total pressure, we're okay there. But with the temperature, we don't have that luxury. We really do have to convert it to Kelvin, which means we first are going to convert the temperature to centigrade degrees, and then we can convert it to Kelvin degrees. So the temperature in centigrade degree, centigrade degrees is equal to 5 over 9 times the temperature in Fahrenheit degrees minus 32. We first have to convert for the reason that the freezing point of water happens at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. We have to make that conversion first and then we convert via, via the ratio of centigrade degrees to Fahrenheit degrees. All right, when we do that, we get the following. This is equal to 5 over 9 times 120 minus 32 which is 5 over 9 times that would be 88 and let's use a calculator for that 
So we have 88 divided by 9 times 5 equals, that's 48.9 degrees centigrade. All right. Now, converting that to Kelvin degrees, we have to add 273, so plus 273, and that gives us 321.9 Kelvin. We'll do that again for the other temperature, temperature 2, so we call that T2, is equal to 60 degrees, so centigrade degrees is equal to 5 over 9 times degrees Fahrenheit minus 32, so that's 5 over 9 times 60 minus 32, which is 5 over 9, times 28. And so we get 28 divided by 9 times 5 equals 15.6 degrees centigrade. And we add to that 273 to get temperature in Kelvin degrees, that would be 288.6 Kelvin. All right, now that we have the temperature before and the temperature after in Kelvin, we have the total pressure. We're now able to find the new pressure at the new temperature. So P2 is equal to P1. P1, we said, was 58.7 PSI times the ratio of the final temperature, which is 288.6 Kelvin, divided by the initial temperature of 321.9 Kelvin. So this is going to be equal to so 288.6 divided by 321.9, multiply that times 58.7, and we get 52.6, 52.6 PSI. Now that would be the total temperature afterwards. We now have to subtract 14.7 to get the gauge temperature. So P2 gauge, or not gauge temperature, but gauge pressure, I should say. So that would be gauge pressure is equal to the total pressure minus the atmospheric pressure. So in this case, that would be 52.6 PSI minus 14.7 PSI. So minus 14.7, and we get 37.9 PSI. All right, and that's how we convert. Remember, whenever we use the ideal gas equation, we must make sure that the temperature is in Kelvin. Typically, pressure should be in Pascals or should be in atmospheres, but as long as you don't care, as long as you have the proper ratio, you can leave it in PSIs. And if you have volumes, typically that would be converted to cubic meters. Again, if it's a ratio, you can get away with not making that conversion. But with temperatures, we didn't have the choice. And that's how we do that.